I'm guessing at some point in all of our lives, we have watched or consumed something that had the effect of behind the scenes, right? You think about maybe a movie you like and you watch something to explain how it was made or, or what went all into putting it together. When DVDs started becoming popular, right? Every movie you got, there was something on there telling you a little more of how it was made. And now with the internet and YouTube, I mean, you can find information telling you what goes into all kinds of things that you like, from movies or TV shows to uh, your favorite musician or artist or chef get in behind the scenes of their kitchen and how they make what they make. And at times, those things can be very interesting. You can learn things that you didn't know and uh, appreciate some things at a deeper level. But next time you watch something behind the scenes, whatever that may be, I want you to ask yourself at the end of that, okay, that was interesting. Will that make any difference in how I live my life this week? And usually the answer is going to be no. Well, we're starting a new chapter in the Gospel of John this morning. And this chapter is the ultimate behind the scenes. And we're not getting a glimpse into the director's chair or some actor's trailer or some chef's kitchen, but into the throne room of God. We we get to eavesdrop on a conversation between the Son and the Father. It's as if the curtain of heaven is pulled open for a second and we get a glimpse on what's going on inside. This is not how some movie was made. This is, how how was the world made? Why was it made? Why why did the cross happen? Why are you and I here? What does this all mean? And and this study is going to be, I hope, a lot more than interesting. I hope it really will be life changing. So are you guys ready to dive into John chapter 17 together? Well, then let's open up our Bibles and let's turn there together. John chapter 17. Now we've been going for the last few months now through John 13 through 16, often referred to as the upper room discourse. Starts with the washing of the disciples' feet and then turns into a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And it all has kind of this extra air of importance because we know these are, this is the last time Jesus is going to get with his disciples before he is crucified. And it all ends with the majestic statement in John 16, verse 33, the last verse of John 16, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so that's how it ends. And, And then Chapter 17, it's going to pivot between Jesus having a conversation with his disciples to now Jesus talking to his father. And we even get the sense that this is in the presence of the disciples. It is often referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And it's the longest recorded prayer we have of Jesus in the Bible. And we're going to see God talking to God, the son talking to the father. And there's three main sections of this chapter. And traditionally, it's been broken down like this. Verses 1 through 5, Jesus is praying for himself. And then Jesus prays in verses 6 through 19 for his disciples. And then in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays really for all Christians. And and that's how we're going to break it down. We're going to spend three weeks looking at each of those sections. And I want to give you one word for each of the sections. When Jesus prays for himself, the word that keeps coming up is glorify. When he prays for his disciples, the word is keep. And then when he prays for all believers, the word is one. So glorify, keep, one. And so today we want to focus on that first section where Jesus is praying for himself, so to speak. And that first word, what was the word I gave you for that first section? What's the main word going to be? Glorify. And so let's read those first five verses together Now, follow along as I read. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, 
and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So there we see the prayer of really Jesus, as they say, praying for himself. And the first thing I want you to do is put yourself in Jesus' shoes for a moment. You know you are about to be martyred and crucified. And it's the last night. And you're going to pray, and you're going to pray for other people. Uh, You're not just going to be totally selfish in your prayers, but what are you going to pray for yourself if you were in that situation? I have a feeling we we might be praying things like, God, this is going to be hard. Give me strength, God. Give me strength to endure. Uh, God, I know this is going to be painful, you know, physically painful. What they're going to do to me, help it not to hurt so bad. And, And Father, I know the plan is six hours on the cross. You think we can get by with three? Maybe even two, right? Doesn't that that start to sound like the things that you and I would pray for? Look at what Jesus prays for when he's praying for himself. And first he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Now that's not a prayer that you and I can pray in the same way. Uh, Look at this verse, Isaiah 42, verse 8. God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Uh, There's really a statement of the deity of Christ right there. Uh, Only God can be really saying, God, glorify me. Uh, Because God's not going to share his glory with false gods. Jesus is God in the flesh. But you still might be tempted to think, well, look, Jesus' prayer is selfish, just like mine would be if I was praying for myself. He's saying, God, hey, glorify me. Well, notice the next phrase. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. That is what Jesus wants in this time. He wants the father to be glorified. Our prayers, the things that you pray for when you're talking to God, they really reveal what your deepest desires are, especially when you are going through suffering, right? When it feels like life is pressing down on you or you are worried or scared, right? What you pray for in those moments reveals a lot about what you care about the most. When Jesus is pressed by the pressure of the coming crucifixion, what comes out? What is revealed? What's revealed is he is consumed with the glory of God. He wants the Father to be glorified. That's what this shows us about Jesus. And as we see things about Jesus, especially in this passage, I want us to see they really are a template for what should be your desire and my desire. So point number one this morning, if you're taking notes, We should be consumed with God's honor. We should be consumed with God's honor. You want a behind the scenes look at the universe? You want to know what it's all about? It's all about the glory of God. Why was the world created? For the glory of God. And even hard questions that we can't fully understand, like, hey, why is evil allowed to exist? To some extent, the answer is going to get back to, well, ultimately, for the glory of God. Because if there was no evil, there's things about God we would never be able to understand. We would never be able to see in contrast to that. Even when we ask, why the cross? Well, why did Jesus have to die? Why did he rise again? For the glory of God. Or even as we've seen in John, why, why do we suffer sometimes? For the glory of of God. Remember that all the way back to John chapter 9? For those of you that can remember that far, when they're like, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents? And Jesus says, uh, neither. This happened so that God would be glorified. That This is the ultimate why. And even the question, why are you and I saved? How have we come to turn from our sins and put our faith in Christ? Why has that happened? For the glory of God. Look closer at verse 2. It says, since you have given him, the Son, authority over all flesh, and then especially notice this phrase, 
to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. That's interesting. We often think of the son, we think of Jesus as a gift from God to us. And that's not wrong. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. Jesus is a, a gift. Or as it says in First and 2 Corinthians, praise be to God for his indescribable gift. But one thing we probably don't think about very much is that if you are a believer, for us as believers, we are a gift from the Father to the Son. He has chosen us to redeem us, to give us to the Son. We have to remember even our salvation is not primarily about us. Uh, do we benefit from being saved? Do we benefit from being saved? Yes. yes, majorly. But is that what it's all about? No, it's really about God's glory. We're a little more pressed for time than normal with doing baptisms at the end of the service, but a verse to look up this week is Ephesians chapter 1. And there's this, in the Greek, long run-on sentence from verse 3 down to verse 14. And it talks about all the amazing benefits of our salvation, and it keeps coming back to this one phrase, to the praise of his glory. We've been redeemed. We've been rescued. We've been given the Spirit. All of these things to the praise of his glory. And even as we celebrate baptisms at the end of the service today, who should be getting the ultimate credit and the ultimate glory? God, the Father. It is all about his glory. Now, even as we think about everything about this world, everything about the church, everything about salvation is meant to cry out for God's glory. That's a very like churchy worship song uh, kind of language that we need to press a little bit into what does that actually mean? What does that mean when we're saying we should be consumed with God's glory? Well, even the idea of the Greek word comes with caring about the honor of somebody or the praise of somebody. That, some, that we want something that is great we want something that we think has some sense of majesty to receive what it's due. And even as we think through our own lives, we feel that about all kinds of things on a much lesser level than God. And even those things that are all much lesser than God in his glory can range from the serious to the silly, right? I'm guessing probably most of us in this room had some sense of frustration as we looked at the news this week, as we looked at the headlines this week, because we care about the honor of the country in which we live. And we feel like it, didn't, it wasn't honored in some ways this week. We probably felt that frustration, and that's more on the serious end. But we also feel it. We, we get worked up about the honor and the glory of things that we'll look back uh, on eternity and kind of say that, that was more on the silly side of things. I don't know what your college experience was like or if you went to uh, college, but where I went to school, a small uh, Christian college, like which dorm you lived in was a big deal, right? And, and dorm rivalry was a big thing on campus. It was a smaller school and kind of with that Christian environment, more people ended up living on campus. So that became something that people uh, cared about. And I went to that school kind of pre-indoctrinated because both of my brothers had gone to the same school. They had both lived in the same dorm. So all the stories had been passed down to me and I show up kind of chomping at the bit. I'm ready uh, to go. And, and right at the beginning of each school year, kind of to establish bragging rights for the year, there was this big dorm competition. And, and as I showed up, I was so fired up for that based on all the stories that I had heard and we lost. We came in dead last. It was this epic, it's this epic relay race all across campus. I was participating in one of the later events, and by the time our team even got to me, like, the winning teams were all done, right? And I, I'm, we're, we're watching that. I mean, it was embarrassing, and the worst part was the dorm that won went and celebrated by all jumping into the pool, and the, the pool at the school was, like, right at the front steps of our dorm. And I remember walking by and saying, that's not right, right? And I, I, was, I was amped up for the glory of my dorm, right? I don't want to see somebody celebrating right on my dorm's front steps. So for the next three years, I was the one in charge of kind of giving the pep talk before that competition. And I would tell that story. Guys, that's what happened. We don't let that happen. We, we, we protect the name, right? We protect the name of our dorm. And we won three straight years in a row. 
and whoop de doo right? Like, who cares about that now? It's, I mean, it's fun when it shows up in a Facebook memory, but it's, it's ultimately meaningless now. And a lot of us, we do that. I mean, just think about sports for a second. A lot of us really care about the glory of some team. And we get really excited when they win and we get angry when they lose, right? Because we care about their glory and their honor. And we, to some extent, need to realize that those aren't very important. But I remember some of that even helped me understand in college, hearing a sermon on Isaiah 26, 8, which says, your name and your renown are the desire of our souls. It kind of gave me a category. Hey, I know what it is to care about the name of something. I know what it is to care about the glory of something. And some of the things we do in this life are silly. Some of the things we care about the glory and name of are serious. But above all of it is the glory of God. And that is what should consume us. Our life should all be about God's honor. Certainly, certainly more than the silly things, but even more than the serious things, like your, the honor of your family or the honor of your uh, job or workplace or business or the honor of your country. And even, it's not uh, God's honor above all those. Hopefully, we as Christians seek God's honor in all of those. God's honor in my family. God's honor in my business. God's honor in my country. This is what we should care about. How will we know if we care about this or not? Well, how do we see that Jesus is consumed with the Father's glory? Well, here we see it's revealed in his prayer. What do your prayers reveal about you? Are you consumed with God's glory? Even let's start with, does suffering drive you to prayer? That's what it did with Christ. And in the other gospels, we see Jesus in the garden Praying for an hour while the disciples are sleeping. Suffering drove him to prayer. And here we get a sense of what dominated that prayer, the glory of God. Some of you, you might be thinking, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm going to still have a job at the end of this week. Some of you might be thinking, I've got a doctor's appointment this week and I do not know what they're going to tell me. And is it wrong for us to pray God protect my job. God, protect my health. Absolutely not. We should pray for those things. But it's the thing that above all of it, God, whatever happens, glorify your name and glorify your name in me. That's why Jesus, the first thing he taught us to pray was our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you are suffering, is that still at the top of your prayer list? And we can have a confidence that God will be glorious right? When I cared about the honor of the dorm I lived in, sometimes that motivated us to do some stupid things, right? As Christians, there's a right way to honor God. We must make sure everything we do to honor him actually reflects his honor and his glory. But that is what should consume us. And part of what should motivate us is that God actually is that glorious. He is the only one that is worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And he will be glorified in the end. It's a beautiful thing. As we move on kind of the second section, right? The one word for this is glorify. And it really it gets to how did Jesus do that? If he's consumed with God's honor, the Father's honor, how, what, how does he live that out? We see it in his prayer, but also we see what he was committed to. Again, in verse two, it says, since you have given him authority over all flesh, What is that authority for? To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And then in verse three, he defines eternal life, which is very interesting and we'll come back to that. And then we see in verse four, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. All right, that's what what he was committed to in the end. God, I accomplished the work that you have given me. And we know that work The son came not to be served, but to serve. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to give eternal life. And he, in verse four, gets to speak of it like it's already happened, right? I have accomplished the work. There was no wavering in Jesus. He was committed. No, I have accomplished. I can speak of what I'm gonna do tomorrow as if it's already happened. I have accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And so the other thing here that we really see that Jesus is consumed with, and it's not really a separate thing, it's 
an expression of the first thing. He's consumed with God's honor, with the Father's glory, but then clearly he's consumed to glorify God by fulfilling the Father's mission. So point number two for us, we need to be consumed with God's mission. We need to be consumed with God's mission. And even as we think about that, um, Jesus' authority to accomplish that mission in ways that, that we can't. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus raised the dead, and I'm not just talking about physically. He could do that spiritually. And that's why when we do these baptisms later, who is the one that we're going to leave here glorifying? God. Because he's the one that opened their eyes. He's the one that raised them from the dead. That's why it's right for us to say or to sing things like, I once was blind, but now, was, now I see. I once was dead, but now I'm alive. And we don't say, I once was lost, but then I found my way. No, I was lost and now I am found because God found me, right? It's right for us to say those things. And we glorify Jesus as we think about what he has done and what he says he has accomplished here in this prayer. But even in verse 2, as he says, since you have given him authority over all flesh, that starts ringing a bell in my mind. Jesus here, he's wrapped up his mission. But later, after he has risen, he passes along that mission. It's a passage we talk a lot about here at our church, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Notice how it starts. Remember how it starts. Jesus comes and says to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He starts with this same idea that he has here in John 17 of all authority. And for him, that was, I'm going to use that to accomplish my mission. When he is ascending, he's saying, now I'm passing that on to the church. All authority has been given to me, so therefore, go. Make disciples. Teach them. Baptize them. Right? This is what we are to do. We don't have the power to open somebody's eyes, to make them see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we do have the ability and the responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the world around us. We are the ones meant to pass on the message of eternal life. And that brings us back to verse 3. What is eternal life? And even before you look at verse 3, just if I asked you that on your way in this morning, what would you say? And I think for most of us, we would kind of say, well, eternal life, when, even when I die, I'm going to live together with God in heaven. And that is gloriously true. And so we would really, most of us, define at first glance eternal life as a quantity of life. I will live forever. But that's not, if you notice, how Jesus defines it right here. And I don't know about you, I hate in this life when I'm forced to choose between quantity or quality, right? I mean, if you say, hey, you can have something really good or you can have a lot of it, I would say, yes, please. I would like a lot of something good. That's what I want. Well, that's what God offers us with eternal life, but he more defines it as a quality of life. Well, what is it like? It says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. Even that doesn't jive with our culture, does it? The only true God. Not that, hey, eternal life is so that you can know yourself and live your best life and, you know, whatever God is involved, great. No, that they may know you, the only true God. Now, again, what do we think of when we say no? We think of knowing information, knowing facts in our head. But really, to understand what he means by no, we should think, uh, not exactly, but more along the lines of uh, the old King James Version in Genesis 4 when it talks about, and Adam knew his wife, right? That's the same word, right? It it's, really has the idea of knowing somebody, having a relationship, an intimate relationship with them. That's what Jesus is saying. I've come to give eternal life, and that eternal life is that they may know you, that they can be reconciled to you, that they can have a relationship to you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Don't we lose sight sometimes of what an incredible privilege that is? 
to be able to say, I know, I have an intimate relationship with the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I don't know if you ever think about, or you know, when you're hanging out with the boys, try to one-up each other, like, hey, who's the most famous person you have in your phone that would answer your call or respond to your text? And some of you might be like, I got nobody. And some of you might be like, yeah, I've, I've actually met some people over the years, right? And you think about that, and it's at best like, yeah, maybe they would take my call. Well, here's the thing. If you're saved, you know God. And he's not just, you know, hey, every once in a blue moon, hey, he, he's there to answer your call if you really need him. No, you live life in his presence. You walk with him every single day. Don't you see that's why you were made? That's what life is really all about. It's not about all the stuff in this world. It's not about all the things the world declares. It's about knowing God and walking with him. This kind of even helps us understand some things we've already seen in the gospel of John. Going all the way back to chapter four, remember the story of Jesus and the woman at the well? And and he says, hey, I've got living water. You'll never be thirsty again. And she doesn't understand, you know, she thinks, hey, great. Taking the the jugs out here to the well outside of town is a pain. I'd like some of that living water so I don't have to do this every day. And he explains it to her in John 4, 13 and 14 saying, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. And the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The living water, what is it? It's knowing God. It is knowing Jesus Christ. Have you tasted that? Have you come through turning from your sin and putting your faith in Christ to drink of the living water and to know what it is to live life the way God designed it to be lived, walking with him, reconciled to him? And have you experienced the satisfaction that can only come from knowing him? If you haven't, stop trying to fulfill yourself by drinking of all the things the world is trying to offer you and come to the waters of Jesus Christ and the eternal life that he gives. And some of you who have done that, even now though, you're being tempted to go off and to settle for less with what the world has to offer and make your life about right here, right now. When really it's about knowing him. And that's, that's where I think the quantity and the quality of life meets. Because if you really know God, nobody can take that from you. Even death can't take that from you. And do you see how that should give us so much joy, hope, peace? I mean, all the things we saw in John 13 through 16, that our lives should be characterized by love for one another, by joy, Uh, that's inexpressible by peace that surpasses all understanding, all of these things, the only way we're gonna get that is by knowing Christ. And this is what everybody needs to hear. Uh, This is the greatest need in the Treasure Valley, in the United States of America, and in the world. And in all of those spheres, if you're paying attention, I mean, there's concerning stuff going on all over the world, whether from big national, international things, even To our community, right, we know this place is exploding with growth and there's, you know, advantages and exciting things about that. And there's, uh, for especially some people, that that presents some difficulty in their lives. And as we navigate all that, there's concerns to be having. None of those concerns are, are really illegitimate. But our greatest concern must be there's people out there that don't know life. There's people out there that don't know God. And he's given me the mission to share that with them. Think about your neighbors. Think about your coworkers. And wouldn't we all love for them to be good neighbors, good coworkers, to be nice people, uh, to probably even share some of our opinions about the world and how it should happen? And if you've got all those things, great. But if they have all those things and they don't know Jesus, then they're a dead person walking. They don't know the reason for which they were made. And God has given us the mission to pass along that message. I want you to seriously think about and ask yourself the question, when was the last time I opened up my mouth to share this good news of eternal life 
with somebody else. Guys, we're the only ones and the others meeting, you know, churches that are declaring the gospel, we're the only ones that are going to be able to do that. The world's not going to do that. The world's going to preach everything else and all the other concerns. It is us who has to preach the message of eternal life. That should be a regular occurrence in our life. Jesus was consumed with the Father's mission. We must be committed to that mission. I want you to turn to one other passage, Colossians chapter 1. We're going to see a very, very interesting thing that the Apostle Paul says. Even as we see as what's often referred to as the Passion Week or the Passion of the Christ, highlighting even just his suffering that he went through. Paul says something very interesting in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. He says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And this is the interesting part. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the body, for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now that should have any thinking person scratching their head a little bit. Wait, there's something lacking in Christ's affliction for the church? What in the world is he talking about? Because I'm pretty sure our series through John 18 and 19 is going to be called It Is Finished, right? So how can he say there's something lacking in Christ's affliction? And what we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt he does not mean is that there is anything lacking in Christ's suffering for the forgiveness of our sins. It is finished. It is done. So what in the world is Paul talking about then? Well, okay, Jesus did that in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. How is everybody in the world throughout history going to hear that message? That is what is lacking. Because after Jesus did his part, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now what is lacking is, the headline is there, the paper's got to be delivered. And that's where the church comes in. And, and that's what you get really in at the end of Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, it says, Him, Christ, Jesus, we proclaim. That's how we do it. We proclaim the message of Jesus and that will cost us something. We've got to be committed to the Father's message. We've got to get the message out. When Jesus was squeezed by the pressure of the impending crucifixion, what was revealed was he was consumed with God's glory and he was consumed with God's mission. And that really is a pattern for us. Charles Spurgeon writes in his book, The Soul Winner. He says, as Rachel from the Old Testament cried, give me children or I die in Genesis 30. So may none of you be content to be barren in the household of God. Cry and sigh until you have snatched some brand from the burning and have brought at least one sinner to Jesus Christ. Our work, Jesus's work was nearing completion. Our work, we don't know how long we have. May we be committed to the mission. And I think this passage, it's not just some interesting information. It should affect our lives. What we see from Jesus here should be a pattern for us. But at the end of the day, this passage, it really should honor and glorify him. And I think we should leave here challenged by how we should reflect him, but we should also leave here in awe of Jesus Christ. Christ. Look again at verse 5 in John 17. He ends this part of praying for himself by saying, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. What, what's going on there? And when you think about the word glory, many times it has what we talked about earlier, that connotation of praise, honor, but sometimes it has this idea of to clothe in splendor, even a, a visible manifestation of glory. You know, think about the transfiguration of Christ when he goes up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he is transfigured. I mean, his appearance was altered. He was shining and bright. 
I think that's more of what we see going on here in verse five. God, restore the the glory, even the visible glory that I had with you before the world existed. And I think in a book where from the first verse, John 1, 1, all the way through, there are so many amazing statements about the deity of Christ. Well, we see one of the most amazing ones right here. Anyone tries to tell you that Jesus is not God, or especially those that would try to argue, well, Jesus didn't pre-exist. He was born in Bethlehem, and that is where it began. Show him this verse right here. Then what in the world is he talking about when he talks about the glory that I had with you before the world existed? Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and he, he gave up that particular aspect of his glory to come and dwell among us and reveal his glory through his life, through his death. But now he is praying, God, restore the glory, even the visible glory that I had with you in heaven. And what I want us to end by acknowledging today is that God has answered this prayer. Point number three this morning, worship the exalted son. Just even now as we Transition to baptism in a few minutes. I just want to give you two passages to to think about and for us to read as we think about worshiping the exalted son. And the first is very familiar, Philippians chapter two. And it described Jesus's mission and how he fulfilled it. Verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He gave up that heavenly visible glory to be born in the likeness of a man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He fulfilled the mission. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This prayer of Jesus in John 17, verse five, it has been answered. God has highly exalted Him, and to him belongs the name above every name. That's right, even in a few moments when we go outside for baptisms, sure, let's, let's encourage and let's celebrate the people that have given their lives to Christ and let's be thankful for the people that talked to them and shared Christ with them. But let's leave here amazed and giving all the glory to Jesus Christ. His is the name that is above every name and let us be the people that gladly bow now and with our tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and I love how it even says it, to the glory of God the Father. You can't separate the glory of the Son from the glory of the Father, just like we saw in this prayer in John 17. And then one even final note of encouragement, Romans 8, 34 says this, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So Jesus, he's been exalted. He's at the right hand of the Father. He is in glory. What's he doing there? He's praying for you and me. That's what he's doing. What is is he praying there? We're gonna have to come back next week to find out. As we see, what does it look like when Jesus prays for his disciples? What does he pray for? For the church. But let's transition now to celebrating what God has done in the lives of some individuals in our church. And let's make this a big exercise in celebrating God for the great things that he has done. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this prayer in John 17. God, we worship you. We want you to be glorified, God. We want to today glorify the son and and praise him for the work that he accomplished for his faithfulness, for his holiness, for his love. God, we want to bow our knees and confess with our mouths that he is Lord. And God, as we transition to baptisms now, Lord, we want to praise you. We want to uh, thank you for the work that you have done. We want to glorify just you, that you are continuing to give eternal life. God, and I pray that we would celebrate that and also leave this weekend with a renewed purpose just to live out the mission that you have given us and to be consumed with your glory. 
So we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.